I like friends who have independent minds because they tend to make you see problems from all angles. This quote by Nelson Mandela totally resonates with the conversation at the winning side today. Winning Side, a series of dialogues about winning themes, such as diversity and inclusion, creating social impact and leading change. Hello and welcome to the Winning Side Suite. This is your host, Sarah Hassan, and our dialogue today is The Conversation. You, you must be wondering, what is this conversation? Well, it is on racial equity. Having said that, today I have made a call to pass the hosting handle at the winning side to my dear friends from University of Cambridge. It's Ariel Strudgens from Executive MBA Batch 2018 and Gathley Yusani, Executive MBA Batch from 2015. And together, they own a wonderful platform, The Bridge. The Bridge is a platform that brings together experts from the University of Cambridge Alma Mater to have courageous conversations. My role today in the conversation is perhaps one that resonates with many listeners out there. I am listening. I am discussing. I am exploring mine and our cognitive biases. So without much delay, I'll pass on the hosting handle to Ariel and Gazelle. Virtual club. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, Sarah is, of course, uh, from Inbo 2018 as well, and mine and, and Max's uh, classmate. Um, and Sarah, I just want to say how grateful I am and we are just to, um, you know, be partnering uh, for purposes of this conversation. I just think in general, Sarah is just one of those people who's just completely open-minded and willing to learn. And I think that the Winning Side podcast, is, if you haven't listened to other um, episodes and other sessions, you definitely should because Sarah is definitely for women, for diversity and for inclusion um, since I've known her, since I've met her. And so I just appreciate just the opportunity for us to share today. So thank you for that. I'm blessing Ariel, as you can see. <laughs> You're very welcome. Always welcome. Thank you. So I wanted to just talk about the bridge a little bit um, about why we're all here. Um, so as part of the executive MBA program at Cambridge, we are all tasked with this huge project called the individual project. Um, and so as part of my project, I was focusing on a virtual talk show that connected the alumni uh, during and after the executive MBA program. And the idea there is just that we are all experts in our own right. And I wanted to create a space where we could all partake of our um, expertise, right? And so the virtual talk show concept came to life. Um, my co-host and dear friend, Gazelle Hishani, who you'll hear from next, um, she just jumped on board and we just ran with the idea. And so now we're three episodes in, working hard on the fourth episode. And I could not have imagined a better outcome and response. Um, our alumni have been super responsive and supportive, um, especially with the, the topic we're going to discuss today, this conversation. And so I'm super grateful to have Gazelle on board, definitely Sarah. Max Volstad, who's also from IMBA 2018, and Idris um, from IMBA 2015 uh, joining us today. And with that said, I will hand it over to Gazelle to talk about what we're going to discuss today. Thank you so much, Ariel. And also, um, just sort of echoing Ariel, thank you so much, Sarah, for inviting us and, and sharing your platform with us. We're, um, we're hugely, hugely thrilled to be here. Um, also, just want to say uh, another thanks to the panelists who really, really dug deep um, to bring what is essentially 
uh, this conversation and ultimately the wonderful audience who participated who, you know, without the audience, we, we don't have a show to Ariel's point. So that is really um, what makes it so special. Uh, unfortunately, one of the original uh, panelists who is, is a was a classmate of mine even, uh, Nancy Yu, uh, wasn't able to make it today, but I will be reading out uh, some of the wonderful comments and work that she did. Um, but uh, so going back to when we originally had this conversation um, regarding issues of race around the world, um, you know, I'm sure we all sort of amongst ourselves with sort of friends, family, people within our network, when we started to see this sort of tsunami of, you know, following several injustices in the early part of the United States, pick up speed, and then it sort of came into further discussions. Um, essentially, people really revisiting conversations about, we all know that institutional racism is here. We all know it's part of a system that we're all a part of. It's been here for quite some time, unfortunately. But what can we do? Um, because institutions are like juggernauts, right? They're slow, they're heavy. And ultimately, what everyone comes down to, for the most part, is that consensus is that things need to change. And what we really wanted to focus on, sort of zooming out, particular focus to the world of work, given that from an Ember perspective, we are quote-unquote leaders. But there's no quick panacea, right? So we've got, and we'll talk to this um, with the panelists um, and with Sara to, to greater extent. Um, so we've got companies who are engaging in diversity, some slightly successful-ish, um, you know, others doing diversity for diversity's sake. Uh, to, to coin a phrase that I've heard um, from a friend, you know, sort of looking at a C-suite board as if it's a Dulux color chart where the focus is not necessarily having who is best for the job, but trying to fulfill quotas. Um, essentially, there's no playbook at the moment. And it's as if the work culture does not take DNI seriously, uh, but as if corporate activism has, has been seen as an opportunity to make hollow statements. Um, I could go on and on what the uh, ultimate consensus is that change is required, beyond required. That's why we're here to talk about this. Change is not easy. It's not comfortable. Uh, it demands introspection, but it makes you think and it makes you grow. Um, so without further ado, I will pass the mic, mic back to Ariel um, to really get into the weeds and about the timeline and history uh, of racism. Over to you, Ariel. Thank you, Gaz. Um, and I just want to step back a second and say that one of the purposes of, of the bridge is to create a safe space for Umbas, right? And so um, I want to say that everything that we discuss here is, is something that um, is within our own, this is coming from our own opinions, right? So it's not reflective at all of the organizations we come from. Um, it's just a reflection of, of our own opinions again. So I want to say that, and I, I want to say I think it's, to me, it was extremely important to have this discussion with a diverse panel because we're talking about, ultimately, we're talking about diversity. We're talking about making sure people are represented. And diversity isn't just one color, it's, it's many. And so as we are on this panel, a part of this panel, and even our original panel, that was kind of the focus to have these different perspectives from all walks of life, different nationalities, so on and so forth. And just being a part of the Cambridge IMBA um, alumni group and a part of that program where we, we learn so much about each other and the importance of diversity. It's just even more so important that we, we have this discussion today and that we can speak, speak freely. So with that said, I'll kind of go into just the timeline here. And of course, I'm pulling this information from a Harvard Business Review um, article. It's called African American Equality in the United States. And it's just really a timeline of um, inequality in the United States. And so I'll just hit some of the highlights. Um, so, of course, there's the transatlantic slave trade, which um, the first 
documented African slaves came over in 1619. Um, and then there was, of course, the Revolutionary War. Slaves are returning after military service and are still enslaved after fighting for their country, essentially. And then slaves were counted as three-fifths of a person in the Constitution. Um, and this goes back to kind of allocating, um, allocating seats in Congress. Um, we were considered three-fifths of a person. Um, then you move into like Civil War and Reconstruction and the abolition of slavery occurred, but then also the Ku Klux Klan was formed. Um, and if you're not familiar with the KKK in the U.S., they are uh, a white supremacist group who basically opposes, I would say, all nationalities, but have a history of just um, oppressive behavior towards African-Americans. And so then, of course, there's the civil rights movement. Um, there's Jim Crow laws. There's the war on drugs, there's mass incarceration. Then, of course, fast forward uh, to, to police brutality and injustice. And, of course, um, we're going to reflect on some of the things that are happening uh, in the news or have happened more recently. But one thing I will say that this timeline points out is just injustice. So there's all, all of these laws that were created to abolish slavery, to give um, African Americans the right to vote um, to essentially continue um, abolishing slavery, right, and, and oppression. So there's all of these laws that are created, but then there's this just constant undermining of the law to continue the oppression. And we're going to talk about systemic or institutional racism later on, but um, it's really just something that um, has to be addressed head on, right? And it starts with these kinds of conversations that we're having today and pointing out and identifying when adjust injustice is, is occurring. So with that said, I will hand it over to Idris to talk about the history of racism in the UK. Thanks, Ariel. I think it's pretty much the same theme in the US that we see in the UK. And I would actually draw parallels, but I'll start from uh, the pre and post transatlantic slave trade because this is actually very important and because a lot of people don't even realize that black people have been in the UK as far back as the 12th century so we had historic records of blacks in the UK at that time <clears throat> and that was pre transatlantic slave trade and if you now go down further down the timeline you had around the 15th century where blacks were expelled from the UK because we had growing communities in places like Liverpool, Bristol, etc. So then blacks were expelled from the UK and it means we never really saw a direct participation of the UK as such in this transatlantic slave trade, but actually this was happening offshore. So I think it's worth pointing that out. And if you go further down the timeline in the 18th century, as we all know, uh, slave trade was abolished and banned in 1807 and 1833, it was abolished altogether. One main point that I'll draw out and why this is important is whilst slave trade was abolished, then uh, the white slave owners were compensated, but then the black slaves themselves were not compensated. So at this point in time, the seeds of inequality were actually sown. So I believe this happened onshore in the US, and in other areas of the world, you actually saw it manifest itself in the Caribbean. And this is important for us in the UK because <clears throat> as a result of the inequality, the poverty that the black people in these sort of islands, the Caribbean islands, had to navigate, they decided to migrate to the UK when the opportunity presented itself. So hence why we had the migrations that we saw in the 40s when you know, people that were qualified, that were well-educated or coming to the UK in the 40s to join the war industries to take up jobs. And this went on into the 50s. And a notable migration wave then was actually the Windrush movement, where about close to 500 people came on board the Windrush ship from Jamaica to the UK. And one thing that's also worth pointing out as well was as far back as the 50s, because it's relevant now in the UK, because we have something called the Notting Hill Cannibal. But as far back as the 50s, we had the first uh, 
racial attacks on black people then around Notting Hill and as a way of broadening the black culture and opening it up to more people we decided to embark on the Notting Hill Carnival so I think we usually do that around August so that's why I said it's, it's relevant in the UK but that was uh, that was the origin of it back then so I wouldn't take too much of time I'll just fast track through time in the 80s we, we all knew about the Brixton riots this was all this was all due to the excessive stop and search from police and that continued right up to the 90s when we had uh, the Stephen Lawrence case who was attacked and murdered and then we also had Wayne Douglas who was murdered in police custody so we had those further riots that, that happened in Brixton here in London and spilled over to other cities in, in the UK as well but if you fast track from the late 90s to 2000s we eventually drew line under the Stephen Lawrence case and one of the key conclusions was that the police was found to be institutionally racist and after that the police were then included under the Race Relations Act which led to the establishment of the Independent Police and Complaint Commission. I think in a nutshell what we're discussing today has been happening as far back as the 80s, as far back as the 40s, 50s etc. But if you look at it now in these current times I think uh, the challenge probably just moved itself into other areas. So we have unemployment. So for example, we have a 40% unemployment amongst blacks as a proportion of population compared to about 17% of unemployment amongst whites as a proportion of population. We have uh, black men are three times more likely to be arrested versus white peers in the UK. And more recently, we also saw the COVID-19 uh, death rate is just about two times higher for black male and about 1.4 times higher for black uh, female compared to uh, the white counterparts and a lot of that's just manifesting from uh, the economic disparities that uh, these sects of the population find themselves compared to the rest of, of, of the population. So in a nutshell, like I said earlier, this is something that's been happening since the pre-transatlantic slave trade but then over time or over the course of time it's just morphed itself into another form of uh, social movement that we're now discussing about, which is what we've called racial inequity. Thank you, Idris. That was, um, I think there's a lot of things that both the US and the UK timeline have in common, right? Definitely when you talk about, when we're talking about the fight continues, we talk about black unemployment rates being three times higher. Um, when we talk about the incarceration rate, um, when we even talk about uh, wealth inequality. Um, it all reminds me too of the webinar we had, um, or that Kamal, one of our, our lecturers, had um, prior to our initial conversation, just talking about some of these facts, right? So there are a lot of things that I think both of these countries, if you will, just have in common, which is which is unfortunate. But again, while we're here today, um, so thank you for that interest. And I wanted to just kind of have your thoughts, Sarah, on, you know, you are hearing about all of these things. Maybe you, you weren't familiar or, or maybe you were um, in some respect familiar with some of the things that have been happening or have happened recently. But I'd just like to kind of get your feedback or, uh, or your initial thoughts on, on hearing all of this recently. Well, thank you, Erin and Idris. I think this is uh, one of the most detailed timelines that I have seen to date. And uh, it really, really is jaw-dropping that something like this exists since the 12th century and since, like, 1619, as uh, you mentioned, Ariel. Now, the one thing I believe is that nobody is born with a perception we do not come to the world thinking that we should hate this or we should like this. So we don't come up with our perceptions. But there is something that we're doing magically wrong since so many centuries that has led to the fact that we are still continuing the fight. So somewhere, we really need to redefine the narrative and change the paradigms. And that's what this timeline highlights. Now, I originally am from Pakistan. And... Um, the subcontinent, Pakistan and India, have had a colonial past. And these histories kind of leave a mark which is very, very difficult to change. And for generations, the, the concepts of what is right and what is wrong is just defined by a very, very skewed scale. 
and timelines like these and conversations like these really make us you know they are like a multicultural awakening call and if not now then i don't know when will we will we start changing mindsets so so yes thank you for having this conversation and sharing the timeline so that people are you know get that awareness it's high time Absolutely. Thank you so much Tara, for just your your reflections. I think it it's always interesting to just have different perspectives, right? And another reason why we just had to have a diverse panel to to speak to some of these issues. Um so I think what we'll do next is kind of pivot a little bit and uh we've talked a bit about the fight continues, right? And um of course we've all we all watch the news uh I don't even know if you need to watch the news to know <laughs> exactly what's going on. You you definitely hear about it in some form. Um and especially with the upcoming US elections. Um so I think w- what we want to talk about now is just what's going on lately, right? This it, it, if when we talk about the timeline and the things that that have been um happening for, you know, centuries we have to talk about why now let's let's talk about why is the escalation why why is everyone why is the attention so focused now and why is everyone kind of jumping on board now like what's what's happened in the recent past to make everyone kind of um just say enough is enough um so i'll ask you um gazelle i'll kind of kind of want your feedback there what do you think is going on lately to make everyone just kind of wake up and pay attention. Totally. Um great question. So I think, you know, particularly the start of this year um with covid uh has well sent shockwaves in all sense of the word um globally. And really if we use that as a starting point with the pandemic which has sort of followed through a little bit, you know, fed through with sort of divisiveness and essentially fueling a bit of injustice um particularly if i'm i'm paying heed to the united states you know in press and politics but again i think the undercurrent is really really important to sara's point just now you know as everyone has been echoing it's very easy to say in words but i think everyone really needs to take a pause and acknowledge that race issues have been ongoing for decades and centuries. You know, if we think of the word century, that is hugely impactful and I think it's important that everyone um listening and all of us really try to make that as visceral as you know, shocking that it's 2020 and we're saying why is this still going on? So it isn't new. But to your question, I think people are finally seeing and and feeling the pain of of these injustices and different individuals have experienced the start of this year sort of the months going in in different excuse me in different ways and it's great to see that finally that this change uh in terms of conversations whether good or bad it's starting to be discussed um in depth I think the start of having covid has impacted things because it's impacted people's fundamental way of living it's fed through to the economy and most importantly um the response by governments um such as in the United States um hasn't been incredibly helpful and this has played out in some form of of social unrest um in terms of sort of the string of acts uh, of social injustice being surfaced in the media um and i might sort of uh, rephrase that and and also say social media which is a huge huge difference compared to goodness even the last decade forget mm-hmm. sort of you know even two decades ago um starting with armad um arberry briona taylor George Floyd, um Elijah McCain and most recently in Wisconsin uh Jacob Blake. Um we're seeing white privilege and, and racism being captured as well. Um also seen in the instance of Abby Cooper and these situations have further amplified I think issues of race um particularly in the United States but also 
um, coming through globally um, to the world. I know, you know, I'm based in the UK. We felt that here as well. Um, for context, uh, Ahmad Arbery was shot by three white men while jogging in a white neighborhood. Uh, Breonna Taylor was shot by police whilst her house was being raided unknowingly in search of a drug dealer. There were no drugs found in her apartment. Um, and there is George Floyd, who had the police called on him for a presumed counterfeit $20 bill. Um, he was murdered minutes after the police. Then switching over, we've also seen the notion of, as I said, white privilege play out with Amy Cooper in New York. Amy was a white woman walking her dog in Central Park when a man asked her to kindly leash her dog. She called the police on him. His name was Christian Cooper, uh, a black gentleman, a bird watcher, and a Harvard graduate. And the whole incident was recorded by Christian. So all these events, coupled with the fact that we're seeing more media coverage, but again, as I say, social media, you know, this thing that we have in our hands, this, this computer essentially in our hands as a phone, uh, I think has played a huge part to that. And coupled with the fact that the population now, for the most part, can find at home, has started to raise a level of awareness on these injustices and a sense of urgency, really, on the need um, for change. But I really do think the social media aspect uh, which can also uh, be used by bad actors acro across the world, and, and we've seen that, um, has also been used to uh, unveil, if you will, the level of all of these injustices. Thank you. I think you're absolutely right. Um, we're just, we're kind of forced to pay attention, right? And then it starts yeah. to hit you like, you know what? This has actually been happening a lot. We yeah. need to do something about it. Absolutely. Oh, you're absolutely right. Um, Max, would you care to kind of um, offer your thoughts on what's happening and how people are responding? Sure. So it is clear that all these factors that Gazale has highlighted have combined to um, create a sense of outrage among a lot of people across the world, enough outrage for people to pour into the streets in many different locations. Protests originally broke out in Minneapolis, which was, of course, the site of the killing of George Floyd. But from there, there have been demonstrations in over 100 cities in the U.S. And according to the New York Times, the protests are widely supported by the U.S. public, with 54% of whites supporting them and three out of four African-Americans supporting the protests. But demonstrations quickly spread to other places, and a significant number of people have turned out for demonstrations in Rome, Berlin, mm -hmm. London, and Paris. And as many will recall, in London, tens of thousands of people turned out to demonstrate in front of the U.S. Embassy, chanting, the U.K. is not innocent. And in Bristol, demonstrators toppled a statue of Edward Colston, 17th century politician who oversaw the West African slave trade. Um, in Australia, demonstrators have drawn parallels between the plight of African Americans in the US mm -hmm. with the plight of the indig indigenous people of Australia. And um, there is a history of many indigenous people dying at the hands of police in Australia. So demonstrations have also occurred in Nigeria, Kenya, Brazil, Argentina, and Israel, and they continue. Um, just the day before the date of this recording, on August 28th, thousands marched on Washington 50, 57 years after Martin Luther King Jr.'s original march on Washington, calling for racial justice. So I think... What this says is that people are truly awakening uh, to this issue at this point in time and are outraged enough to demonstrate all over the world. So we're really looking at um, a truly global phenomenon. And uh, Idris, I don't know if you want to talk about some of the things you've seen 
in the corporate world responding to the outrage that has uh, filled the streets. Thanks, Matt. We have seen uh, different different forms of responses from different spheres. And from the corporate world, I think historically, the corporate world is always, has always distanced itself from these sort of uh, divisive social issues. But this time around with George Floyd, we had leading organizations taking different forms of actions. In my mind, I've actually called these macro or broader actions and also the micro actions. So the examples of the macro actions would be Apple on June 2nd, Apple shut down radio stations on its music app, giving listeners a single stream that played Fuck the Police, which is, an, which is one of the NWA records from 1988. And then you also had, we also had Lego telling online affiliates to remove about 31 mainly police themed set of bricks as part of taking a stand against racism and inequality. I think the more c common one or the more popular one we saw recently was actually leadership from a lot of corporations releasing statements on social media. So leadership from the likes of Google, uh, Standard Chartered, McKinsey, etc., all really strong and passionate statements via the social media platform, uh, criticizing racism and making their position clear. And this is actually all the more profound because these these are not only personal, but then they're also much more readily accessible for everyone to actually uh, see and be influenced by the statements. The other sort of actions I have seen are more. The micro actions, so organize, uh, actions organizations are taken within their own companies or their own businesses. And I think there is more time to discuss this along the line when we start to discuss how can I get involved. So I'll leave the micro actions for later just because of time. Thank you, Idris. I think mm -hmm. too. It, sorry, sorry. sorry. Yeah, to Idris's point, I wanted to share that, you know, colorism is something which is. Um, which unfortunately is uh, um, has plays a role in the perceptions in the Asian markets as well. And uh, recently, companies, uh, quite renowned companies, have changed their brand image and perception. For example, there is a very very popular brand, uh, a beauty product uh, by Unilever, titled as Fair and Lovely in Asia. And uh, after all these instances, they have now. Change, decided to change the brand name and it's a shame it took this event to change the brand name because beauty by no means is associated with fairness and uh, and, and and this is something that really you know once again is an awakening call absolutely i think to I'll just kind of reflect personally on on everything that's happened um so we've talked about, you know, things like this have happened for centuries. And I think for me, after the whole George Floyd event, I, I just felt deflated, like hopeless, deflated and like, you know, here we go again. But to see the response, not only in the U.S., but around the world in the middle of a pandemic, <laughs> you know, people essentially risking it all to stand up and say enough. This is enough of this, you know, that has been so encouraging um, because it's not like black people could, could do this ourselves, right? We, we have um, all of these moments in history, definitely uh, with uh, Dr. Martin Luther King and the March on Washington. We have all of these different events that are etched in stone, etched into our history, and yet here we are still. Right. And so I think just everything, just to see the global response and just people, even this, this conversation, this panel, you know, people stepping up to say, yes, I want to get involved. I want to speak. I want to talk. Let's do the research. Let's come together. It's all been personally healing for me, but I think healing for a lot of people, just, you know, knowing that someone has your back and, and that someone that you don't even know is fighting for you. It's just, it's just a sign of, of you know, people coming together and uniting on, um, on justice. 
really. I think that the response has been overwhelming. There's still work to be done, of course, but, um, you know, there's progress. There's significant progress. So anyway, um, sorry, it's my little spiel here. Um, <laughs> so I wanted to also uh, pivot a little bit to talk about some of the things, some of the questions we've heard people ask. And so one of the things that's great about the bridge is that we have a safe space where we can come to the table and ask those tough questions and be know that we're in a judgment free zone and we're not going to be judged based on what we think or the questions we have or what have you. So I wanted to kind of talk about some of these, I'll call them frequently asked questions um, that we've heard. And I'll start with just this whole concept of white privilege. And I know we're on a podcast and you guys can't really tell what nationality we are. <laughs> but I'll just point out that Max is white. <laughs> and so I thought it was fitting um, for Max to talk about white privilege and really just tell us, what is it? What is white privilege, Max? Well, thanks, Ariel. Um, it's definitely a, um, a term that can hit a lot of buttons. But the term itself has a long history. Prior to the civil rights movement in the U.S., the term generally referred to systemic advantages given to white people uh, by the United States, such as the right to vote and the right to buy a house in the neighborhood of your choice. Um, and these are two things that we know have systemically been denied to African Americans for a very long time in the U.S. After the 60s, the term has come to be used not just to describe the above advantages, but um, um, an attitude that, um, or a mindset that whites have historically had, um, which results from this um, access to benefits that have traditionally been denied to African Americans. So the best definition I've seen of white privilege is from Francis Kendall, and it is, quote, having greater access to power and resources than people of color in the same situation. Mm -hmm. And I think to be clear, we have to say white privilege is not the suggestion that white people have never struggled. Um, and in fact, many white people do not enjoy the privileges that come with relative affluence, um, even today in 2020. And in addition, it is not the assumption that everything a white person has accomplished is unearned. Most white people who are successful have worked extremely hard to get where they are. Um, but it really should be viewed as a built-in advantage that white people have frequently in multiracial society. And um, Gazale mentioned earlier one of the recent events um, that has generated a lot of headlines, uh, which was the Central Park incident. And I think if we think about that incident, um, we realize that it is an example of white privilege at its most pernicious. And in that scenario, a white woman was playing with her unleashed dog in an area of Central Park where uh, dogs are required to be on leashes, an African-American man asked her to put the dog on the leash. And in, in the end, and this is all recorded, as Gazelay pointed out, uh, the woman said, I'm going to call the police and tell them there's an African-American man threatening my life. So if you think about the situation, it's clear that um, the woman who called the police here feels free to make up a story about an African-American. And she's secure in knowing that um, she can wield the power of the police against an African-American. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a terrible incident. It's received a lot of media attention. 
uh, appropriately. And I think it is a good example of the white privilege that does exist in the world around us. And um, I think it's something that we should all be aware of. Um, so that's white privilege. Ariel, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about systemic racism. Absolutely. Um, I, I just want to highlight something that you said that I think it's very important to, to note, right? You said that it's not, we're not saying white privilege isn't saying that people haven't worked, white people haven't worked very hard to get where they are. It's more speaking to a built-in advantage that they have over people of color or minorities. So I think that's important because we're not dismissing, we, we don't want to dismiss anybody's hard work, right? Um, it's, there's success in that, and you don't want to dismiss any, any accomplishments that people have had, but it's just more so that advantage, right? So I think, thank you for, for bringing that up. I think that that's definitely a key point. So one of the things you mentioned as well is just this concept of, systemic racism. And I think the hardest thing about systemic racism is that you can't touch it, right? It's not something that's completely tangible. It's something that has to be studied, that you have to be aware of, that you actually have to see in action. Um, but I'll just, I'll just start with kind of the definition, definition of systemic or institutional racism. And it is a form of racism that is embedded as normal practice within society or an organization. It can lead to issues, it can lead to such issues as discrimination and criminal justice, employment, housing, healthcare, political power, and education, among other issues. And so to me, this concept of, um, we'll call it institutional or systemic racism, is really driven by implicit bias. Right. And so if you've been a part of the Embla, you know all about biases. Um, but this implicit bias refers to the attitudes or stereotypes that affect our understanding, actions and decisions in an unconscious manner. It's something that we've been taught that's kind of ingrained in. It's a bias. Right. You can't really see it. It's almost a blind spot. Um, but it's these, these different attitudes and stereotypes that are built in. And so when we talk about the Amy uh, Amy Cooper situation, her calling to say there's a black man threatening my life, that's a trigger, right? Especially, well, it's been a trigger, as we've seen in the news with law enforcement. And so um, I even thought about personally whether I've experienced um, systemic racism. And so I was just thinking about um, in organizations, a lot of times there's um, a list. There's a list of people that you consider to be high performers or people that you want to create a pipeline to leadership for. And so the gate holders of this list or the people that have access to this list, if they're biased, then the people that are on that list have an advantage. As we discussed before, they have this advantage that other people don't have um, access to. And so, you know, th this is another example of, um, you know, where people of color or minorities are kind of left out of this pipeline or this access or not even considered. I think let's just start there. They're not even considered for these opportunities because the gatekeepers of this list and the people who are making decisions for who should advance, they, they aren't mentally thinking that they should even consider this other group of people. Um, and then I thought about one of my friends as well, uh, who spoke with an HR manager once, just to talk about why there weren't any black managers in, in the organization. And the response was, maybe black people don't want to be managers. And how ridiculous is that, right? <laughs> There's an entire group of people who don't want to advance. It's just like wow. <laughs> crazy. Yeah. It's like, okay, do you really think that? And and to feel completely justified with that that thought, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but that's just an example to me. Um, some personal examples of, of 
systemic racism, um, just people being kept from opportunities to advance. Um, did anybody else want to reflect there or? or, or I think one anything? other thing to note, and obviously it's sort of, uh, I don't know if the pink elephant in the room is the right way to phrase it, Ariel, but it's, it's really interesting because at the end of the day, as we all know, and as sort of general awareness is that race is effectively a social construct. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this thing of, you know, pit pitting one against the other and not supporting, you know, an entire group of people when race is in fact a social construct. And to your point, still being utilized to put, uh, you know, a huge portion of people down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is just mind blowing but um but I think you know it important to sort of raise that as well, and that uh yeah, I mean it's just illuminating and, and mind blowing at the same time absolutely blind spots right yeah <laughs> yeah, Biases yeah. And blind spot for sure guess. so what the context of celebrating diversity. It was mentioned about Notting Hill Carnival, and it's ir ironic that we are uh, hosting this podcast on this bank holiday for the carnival. There is so much gain from celebrating diversity. In fact, there's a recent research report by UK Innovate that actually states potential for innovation increases when diversity comes through. And according to the survey and the focus groups that they did, it was the highest in the black community, which was 35%, followed with those which had a disability and followed by those which were from minority groups and did not have a disability. So clearly there is a lot of scope that needs to be tabbed, really. That's a good, yeah, definitely something that we've touched on many times throughout the Denver program, right? Diversity and importance of diversity and inclusion. Thank you, Sarah. Um, that was a good good resource. And while we're talking about resources, we'll definitely share just kind of research that um, the team has been so gracious and uh, uh, to to pull together. So we'll provide that as well. Um, so I definitely wanted to, as one of our kind of last frequently asked questions, I wanted to speak to just this concept. I know that people are very familiar with. <laughs> just this uh, all lives matter versus black lives matter. Um, so Gazelle, would you, would you care to kind of weigh in? What do they both mean and, and what's, the, what's the big deal? Absolutely, absolutely. And great question, you know, and as sort of yourself, Ariel and I, and everyone have said throughout um, the course of this show, this is essentially what this whole platform to us is about. It, it is about having these conversations, uh, you know, feel free to, to ask about them and, and to get involved in, in the conversation. Um, I'll, I'll feed into this later on, but the world is devised enough as it is. There's so much polarization driven by bad actors who I'm not going to name right now because they don't deserve the opportunity to be named. Um, <laughs> it's, it's divvied up enough. So the question is over to us. And whilst we have a platform, we don't want to contribute to that period. Right. Mm -hmm. So coming back to the point of what we as, you know, as a panel, as a group, et cetera, are trying to achieve here is to absolutely initiate conversations about this. Um, Black Lives Matter is an organized movement that started in the United States in 2013, uh, following the acquittal of George Zimmerman in the shooting of Trayvon Martin. And for those who aren't familiar with the case, Trayvon, who was 17 at the time, was shot by Zimmerman in a gated community in Florida. Zimmerman was acquitted, claiming self-defense. In the US, as we've uh, pointed to uh, throughout the conversation, there's a long-standing history of police brutality against unarmed black men and Black Lives Matter, or BLM as it's otherwise known, focuses on advocating against incidents and essentially grown from a hashtag to, to a, glo a global movement. Mm -hmm. um, one which has been heard of in the UK as well, 
And I just wanted to note that, you know, when this group and when we are talking to Black Lives Matter, we are paying heed to this original organized movement that started in the US in 2013 to support BLM. And this is where I know we come from, is to acknowledge and understand that Black lives have been mistreated, have been disadvantaged, and that their liberation is critical to us all. To come full circle, to say that all lives matter in that context means that you do not acknowledge the disadvantages, that you believe all individuals can treat, continue to be treated equally in this system that we all operate in. And I want to sort of finish off with one, uh, a, cu a couple of numbers here that Obama gave once and stated that the United States is home to 5% of the world's population, mm -hmm. that 25% of the world's prisoners, African Americans, mm -hmm. make up 6.5% of the American population, but 40.2% of the prison population. Mm -hmm. Whilst a white male has a 1 in 17 chance of ending up behind bars, for black males, it's one in three. Staggering. Yeah. Precisely. Yeah. yeah. But again, you know, what something we that we all need to talk about. Yeah, and, and that's what we define as a developed world, per se. Exactly. Correct. In, within the context of a liberal democracy. Mm -hmm. Right? Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. We talk about freedom, <laughs> being a part of the free world, but definitely not owning, not owning our stuff. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for explaining that so, so perfectly, Gazelle. Um, does anybody else kind of want to weigh on, weigh in on, on that concept or, or things that they've seen in action? I will say, um, I participated in a march in July. I don't even know what month it is. Uh, it might have been August. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but I, I had a chance to participate in a march, um, and it was called One Race, and it was about um, uh, Christians coming together and, and you know, uniting and, and being against racism. Um, and so, and it was here in Atlanta, and I will tell you, it warmed my heart um, just to see all of these people out just worshiping together and to hear people, everyone chanting Black Lives Matter and, you know, end racism and just to see it and to hear it and to, to be on a united front. It was just overwhelmingly amazing, <laughs> you know, and um, I think it's again, I think it's. It's a sign of things to come. Things are changing um, or permanently changing. Um, yeah. Uh, let's see. So going to our next topic, or I guess our final topic, how can we get involved? So we've done a lot of talking about what's happened, what, you know, what's our history, what has happened, why, is, why are we escalating all of this right now? Now let's talk about action, right? Because it's one thing to, to talk about what's happening. It's another thing to, to completely to get involved. And so I'll just kind of toss it over to, to Idris. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll toss it over to Max to just talk about how can we get involved? What are, what are some simple ways for us to get involved? Personally? Sure. Um, I think um, there are five quick topics that uh, come to mind. And um, I know diversity is a word that has been used a lot over the past two decades. But as someone brought up earlier, um, not only is diversity the right thing to do for people to make them bring everyone to the table, but I think, Sarah, you're the one who said, and there was a lot of this in our EMBA education, diverse teams are actually better than non-diverse teams. So you get a better end product. So I think one thing we can do on a personal level is try to encourage diversity in 
both our personal lives and especially in our professional lives, in whatever organization we work in. Um, encourage diversity in the employment applicant pool and in the hiring process uh, within your organization. Join diversity committees. Talk about diversity. And, um, you know, keep the conversation going. But I will say another topic. Um, recently, people have talked more about diversity and inclusion. And I do think it's important to keep inclusion in mind um, because you can bring a diverse group of people together. But if not everyone feels included, then um that group is not going to function well and it's not going to hold together so you better preach <laughs> <laughs> well i've seen i've seen um i've been working in the corporate world for 20 years so uh we've been talking about diversity for that entire period and you know with good intentions and then uh, but I've seen sometimes a lack of inclusion have uh, a negative effect on the efforts that have been made towards diversity. So if you really want to make a difference, you have to do both things, encourage and increase diversity and work on inclusion. Mm -hmm. Really quickly, a few other things, I think. Um, Unconscious bias um, is something that we should all be aware of and explore. It's something that does exist. Uh, it came up earlier in this conversation, and it exists not just on the race front, but in, in many different contexts. But in talking about race, it's important to be aware of unconscious bias. And within an organization... Um, you know, you can bring in consultants uh, to talk about it. And I've been to some amazing presentations about unconscious bias. And um, there are a lot of resources out there to help you talk about and think about unconscious bias. And um, really quickly, I will just say also two other things. Being open to the discussion on race is really key and um okay. not to be defensive and initiate the discussion if you can but at the very least be open to the discussion mm -hmm. and finally um i think on a personal level we all do need to work on self-education um because our educational systems don't really focus on the ugliness of our pasts. And I think every country is the same that way. We want to look at the glories of the past, not the ugliness. Um, especially if the ugliness continues to have ramifications mm -hmm. in the current world. So um, I have learned a lot just, uh, you know, doing research recently in the past six months, both um, preparing for our bridge presentation and um, on other fronts, I've learned a lot, especially from the timelines that um, we discussed the UK and US timelines earlier in the presentation. Um, there's a lot that is really not discussed in our educational systems and it would be great to change that. But in the meantime, you have to try to educate yourself on these issues, and there's a lot to learn for many of us. Yes, definitely. I like just your point on, you know, personally educating ourselves, and, and you know, it's so easy nowadays to to educate yourself. It, it information is everywhere, right? Um, but there's all kinds of resources, good resources too. Um, out there, and again, we'll we'll share as well. But yeah, definitely resources out there we have access to. But I, I totally agree with your point. History is not just the victories; <laughs> it's some of the failures as well. Um, 
And if you are if you are smart, you learn from history and you do better. <laughs> you know, so anyway. Um, thank you for sharing, Max. Um, Idris, did you want to kind of reflect on guess from an organizational perspective for those folks who are in the C suite, those people who want to get involved, how can they do that? How can they influence change? Yes, thanks, Ariel. And thanks, Max, for those points you shared earlier, because some of them do overlap as well. So I think, first of all, I would say the onus is on our business leaders and leadership team across organizations to support an open culture and environment where the topic of race is openly discussed. And also the onus is on leadership to help provide or facilitate tools that would help these discussions to happen, especially in the spirit of inclusion and the link to, to, to brand strategy. And I think the point on inclusion was something uh, Max talked about earlier. I'd actually just quickly give an example. So according to the Financial Times, when Nike launched its advertising campaign featuring the NFL quarterback Colin Kaepernick. And when Nike did this, there was actually a hashtag trending on Twitter, which was Nike, hashtag Nike, Nike boycott. And that was just because Colin Kaepernick had previously protested against racism by kneeling during uh, the national anthem. And I think there initially we saw that the company's share price fell by 3%. Mm -hmm. So you could have thought that was a move that backfired. Why have we backed Colin Kaepernick? But in the end, we saw that by the end of the campaign, uh, Nike sales increased mm -hmm. and his stock price eventually did rise by about 30%. So hopefully wow. that's some encouragement to, to uh, company executives and company leadership. There is definitely the appetite for positioning companies as uh as leaders, especially in the context of inclusion, uh, racial equity, and all of these topics that we've been that we've been uh, talking about directly or indirectly from this forum. Another point I would also draw up would be what companies have been doing as part of the discussions I have been having. So so far, I have seen companies in the UK here signing up to the business, the community race charter at work. So in case there are companies out there that haven't done this yet, I would encourage uh, business leaders to take a look and, and sign up to this. To, to this. It's actually very simple to do. And it would, it, it's, it's just part of committing uh, the organization as a whole to uphold uh, certain standards to promote uh, racial equality. Something else we have seen that I have observed is that companies are beginning to review uh, the grassroots work so, and, uh, and this, I'd actually be direct, so this is broadening talent recruitment pipeline for mm -hmm. senior and grad hires, and also reviewing uh, the purpose of internship schemes. You know, gone are the days where internship schemes were just open to a friend of a friend. These days, especially given what we have seen, it's an opportunity to give those kids that would never, ever get a chance to work in the corporate world or that do not have anyone in their immediate environment working in the corporate world it's a, it's a chance to give them that opportunity to, to to see what it's like to work in a you know in a corporate environment it's something we're taking on in my organization it's something i'm championing as well uh something else we are seeing is uh, a broader review of diversity and inclusion across senior management with companies committing to quotas and i think this is the first time we are seeing this so we've seen uh mckinsey go out to commit to doubling black colleagues and black mm -hmm. leaders mm -hmm. in, in four years time. And this is very important when we take a look at the statistics, because if you look at the Fortune 500 companies, we only have black ethnic minorities representing around 0.8% of the CEOs. So this is even less than 1%. So it does ring alarm bells and does raise the need for us to, to all act. And lastly, still in the context of the corporate world or C-suits, one thing I would also bring into the fray, is accountability. So we are beginning to see companies review how best they can hold themselves accountable. And one of the things that has come up is companies uh, prioritizing DNI disclosure, just like they prioritize 
financial accounts disclosure. So there, there is a talk of companies releasing or publishing their own DNI standalone reports annually, yeah. and also dedicating sections on their web page. You know, and there are companies doing this already. So I know I'm aware Google already do this. I'm aware companies like Lloyd's Banking Group already do this. I'm aware Deloitte, uh, the consulting company, also do this. So these are also just examples, hopefully, that would encourage uh, some of our CISO listeners listening that this can, this can actually be done. Mm -hmm. That's a really, I think that that example with Colin Kaepernick is, is so perfect. And I always, I've been saying for a while now, what a great day to be Colin Kaepernick. <laughs> I was saying if I were him, I would just wear a t-shirt that said, I told you so, like every day. <laughs> I told you so. Um, but fortunately, he's a lot more humble than, than I am. Um <laughs> But no, I think that that's fantastic, you know, that people, organizations, these these leaders of organizations are essentially, you know, getting involved in, in joining in and saying, this isn't right. And this is what we're going to do about it. I think the best example I've seen is with Google. There was like a four page letter <laughs> that they put out with all these different initiatives. Um, and to my knowledge, they're following through with it. And so I just. I mean, I love that. I love it. Again, it's just overwhelmingly amazing how, um, you know, everything's kind of falling into place. And so thank you, Idris, for, for, for that input. Um, so I'll, I'll toss it over to, toss the mic um, <laughs> over to Gazelle. Would you care to reflect on how else people can get involved? Sure, absolutely. I think... I think as with anything um, in life, I think as long as you take steps, they can be the tiniest of steps. But as long as you um, have an intent to move forward, because at the end of the day, you know, within our ember bubble, so to speak, our little ember community and ecosystem, um, no matter sort of how we've got here, it is fundamentally a platform of huge privilege. And we have access to a huge amount of resources, of people, et cetera, et cetera. But for many people who are now listening to this podcast, that might not be the case. And as with many things um, that are happening today, uh, social media at a grassroots level has been really able to support these things. So whether it's just as simple as, you know, you're a parent and having uh, conversations with your children, um, whether you are a teacher or a head teacher at a school, uh, because I think, you know, the general uh, theme of everything that we've been saying is it comes down to education mm -hmm. and essentially uh, you know, within syllabuses in school, uh, no matter where in the world, um, if these conversations could be started at an early age, um, yes. I think that's hugely important. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, the thing that I think is really crucial coming back to the, the bridge and also to, obviously to Sarah's platform as well, doing a shameless plug there, um, but we're sort of at a certain age, if you will, and something I think as adults we have to be generally mindful of is you can get used to doing things that are comfortable, um, sort of paying heed to what I said at the start of the show. And you, it's very easy to get stuck in your ways and, and to not go towards things that might challenge you. But so long as I think people start to lean into the conversation, which is really what we're trying to achieve here. And a lot of people ask and hear about the bridge and they're like, you know, what's it about, etc. Um, I think between Ariel, myself, everyone who has been humble and, and gracious enough with their time to contribute to the show and drive massive efforts, if you want, and if you want to put a label on our culture, um, which to us really is our mission statement, it is a culture of inclusion and fundamentally about purpose maximization. Um, 
a lot of people love floating the term around about social impact and social innovation. And, and I think I can say this freely, freely to Ariel because we've having, we've been having quite a lot of conversations over the last few months. Um, we're just pretty humble. We just call it helping one another out. You know, it's just semantics. <laughs> and I think it's something that our parents' generation, their parents' generation, that's what this is all about to zoom back and, and zoom into what we're trying to do here. Um, as I said before, there are plenty of bad actors out there who are actively working on the polarization of society. Um, but we've got to be really, really careful because everyone comes from a certain walk of life. And just because they are asking questions about things like Black Lives Matter versus All Lives Matter, um, you know, it doesn't mean that they're not leaning into the conversation. And mm -hmm. I, uh, I think the really crucial point for me and why it's very difficult to hone in and say the takeaways from this are X, Y, Z, um, is that we just need to listen to one another. We need to start having conversations with one another because where we are in the world is um, the pockets of encouragement, but at the same time, uh, there is some kind of um, work stream going on where everyone's being pitted against one another. Um, and there's sort of this uh, cancel culture where views aren't allowed to be expressed. That's not what we're about here. We want people to start talking about it. And we want, that's the whole point of a dialogue. It's the complete opposite of a monologue. Mm. So whether for us, for example, we've been speaking with Judge and we've been hearing some um, encouraging steps that they would like to take in moving forward, whether it is within your organization, but it is essentially um, a 360 holistic uh, work effort, if you will. Yeah, and it, absolutely. right, and it really starts with sort of taking accountability for yourself. Mm -hmm. We're all on our own personal journeys, um, but we're not alone, you know, and if we can come together in different shapes or forms, whether it's with us like this or with your neighbors or with your friends or your families, having these conversations um, and building up on them that's really um, the important thing. Um, you know, with a topic as big as this, Ariel and I have, and the panel have discussed at length that this is not the first and the last time we're going to have this discussion. In fact, we're looking to sort of maybe six months time uh, tap into our network and see how organizations are doing, what is going on. But it's not as simple as a checkbox exercise that because you've filled a diversity and inclusion um, work stream at work, then that's it. Um, we really have to look at um, the discourse we're using, the language that we're using in, in general. Um, so I think that as long as one uh, pays heed to that, because as we've all said in different costumes, um, this has gone on for centuries. So it's our work effort is going to test our patience, is going to test our resolve and ultimately our intellectual incision. So if we can focus on these elements and gradually work through, to me, that's a tremendous outcome. Um, and as I said before, race is a social construct and we are all part of that society. Definitely. Thank you, guys. I, I mean, You're welcome. I totally agree it takes bravery right yeah to to even be intentional about doing the 360 and, and just taking a look within um so thank you thank you for that was a, a an excellent way <laughs> to just wrap this all up um but before i hand it back over to sarah i will say so i will share um I was sharing with Sarah once upon a time, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, um, about how I found out I was black. Um, and so uh, I was, I think I was in the first grade and all the kids were outside at recess and there was a little girl, her parents brought her an Easter basket. And so naturally all the kids were around her, 
we all wanted a piece of candy and you know we wanted we wanted that that attention that just you know inclusion if you will and um she at her basket she's kind of holding it over her head and she said i'm only giving candy to the white people and there were, it wasn't a really diverse uh, a group, but the few of us who were not white just kind of looked around. And that was my introduction to being different and being black. And I was just devastated, you know. Um, and then fast forward to a couple of weeks ago, I was walking down the street, just, you know, walking home and I ran into a little boy. He was walking in front of me. And he didn't look like me. And he turned around. He, see, he said, hi, how are you doing? And I said, oh, hi, I'm good. How are you? He said, BLM. And I just, oh, my God, I wanted to, like, pick him up and hug him and take him home. And then I realized we're still in the middle of a pandemic and I might be arrested. So I didn't do it. <laughs> but I just thought, like, how special is that from where we start, well, where I started? to where we are now, you know, we have discussions all the time about is this, is, are things changing? And to me, if our young people have a different mindset, then there is hope for the future. And so for me, I'm completely convinced in um, having this group, having our panel, seeing all the change that's going on, seeing corporations respond. Um, and then I am doing my part as well. Right. So my circle of friends even um, is, is diverse. And I'm just I want to say that I'm so grateful and so fortunate to have met all of you and everyone within our EMBA community. And I want to thank you, Gazale Yushani, Sara Hassan, Idris Alimi, Almi Diora. <laughs> And Max Ball said, I want to thank you. And Tracy McNeil and Nancy Yu, I want to thank you all for just your research, the time that you put into everything, coming to the table multiple times, all of the grit that it took to just come together and, and bring this all to pass. If nothing else, it is healing for me. And I think as a result of this podcast, hopefully it'll be uh, information and awareness and healing to others as well. So thank you. Thank you so much. It's time to design, create, and build an inclusive club. If you enjoyed this dialogue, please do share this podcast episode as a care gift with your friends, family, and wider network. Do leave us a feedback in the comments section below and follow us on Instagram at the Winning Side Podcast. Till then, ciao ciao.